So um, thank you for coming to this session. I, uh, <clears throat> hi. I know that you have a lot of other uh, exciting and interesting sessions to go to. And I, so I appreciate you coming here to learn about the Documenting the Now project. Um, it's quite strange to be speaking to this kind of room configuration where, but uh, yeah. yeah, actually it's quite strange to just be speaking in general. Um, but uh, so I apologize. Uh, also, uh, I didn't manage to get my speaker notes working properly, so if I stumble around more than usual, uh, that's probably why. Um, so I, I'm gonna talk to you about this Documenting the Now project, and um, uh, these uh, three names that you see uh, below the, uh, you know, on the lower side of this, the screen are the primary investigators in the project. But I also wanna mention two people uh, in addition to these three, uh, Chris Freeland, who's sitting over here, helped us get started, get the grant started um, at Washington University in St. Louis, and, uh, and also uh, Meredith Evans, who uh, is no longer at Washington University, also helped get the project started there too. So th their names kind of need to be there, but, but since they're not actively sort of working on the project right now, uh, these are the three kind of main people. Um, and uh, so, I mean, before I leave this slide, I probably should say like, the, the, the purpose of the Documenting the Now project is to build um, community tools and uh, sort of ethical practices around the social, uh, the activity of collecting social media data and uh, working with social media data and preserving social media data. So those are the, the kind of like, the, that's the sort of the big umbrella that this work is happening under. And, um, I probably don't, I, I won't spend any time really kind of trying to convince you that this is a worthwhile thing to do um, because I think all you have to do is look at the current uh, political uh, situation and what's happened in social media, uh, you know, in the last year, two years uh, to see that, you know, could we ever understand, you know, like what's happened in the, <laughs> in the last year without looking at what has happened in social media? I think the answer is, for me anyways, no, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm not gonna try to convince you uh, that it's a, a valuable thing to do to collect social media as part of this, um, but, I, but I do hope to convince you about how you go about doing it uh, if you choose to do it. So uh, the, the, the three big, and you may have guessed this already from the three names, but uh, the three uh, main uh, institutions that are uh, working on this are uh, University of California, Riverside, uh, Washington University in St. Louis and uh, the University of Maryland, and we um, are we've got some uh, some very uh, generous funding from the Mellon Foundation to help us sort of work on this problem together. And I'll explain how these three institutions came together, hopefully as part of this narrative of of, of uh, how the project came about. Um, and uh, the, the work that I'm gonna be talking about is work that these people did. Uh, you know, I had sort of a hand in it too. I'm down there at the bottom there, but, uh, but these other people, um, so uh, Desiree Jones-Smith is our project coordinator um, in, at Washington University in St. Louis. Dan Chudnov there is our, uh, he calls himself a data engineer in this. He does lots of other things, but in this project, he calls himself a data engineer. Um, uh, Alexandra Dolan Mescal is our user experience designer, and Francis Kaiwa is a, a DevOps engineer. We have Vernon, oops, uh, Vernon Mitchell, who's um, working at Washington University, uh, who is a, a PI on the project, and uh, Burgess Jules, in the, down here on the lower uh, center, is um, also a PI, and he's working on the uh, uh, community, uh, really sort of like the, the community outreach and aspects of the project, building a community, which I'm gonna to talk to you about. And I'm, I'm a, a, a developer on the project, so that's normally my excuse for my presentation, you know, like uh, I'm not used to doing this, but uh, it, it gets old. I, I use it every time I talk, and so. Uh, and then these are, uh, this is our advisory board, which uh, as I'll tell you in a second, like these people have been very instrumental in helping us uh, figure out what uh, we're doing, uh, and uh, you may. I'm not going to list all their names here, but uh, or you know, for you now. But uh, if you know any of them, you probably recognize that we're we're very lucky to have them 
uh, working on the project. Um, and uh, we, we recently drew on the, these uh, folks. They came to uh, St. Louis actually during the summer. And we had a really excellent meeting uh, where we kind of worked on really largely focused on sort of the community and ethical aspects of the, of the, um, the work that I'm going to tell you about. If you have a laptop open and you feel like uh, what I'm saying is getting kind of dull and you want to play around with this prototype, we have uh, a, this is kind of a, a development prototype, uh, thinking of it as a, it, it's really almost like a straw man at this point, but it's, it's, a, um, it's an application that we're using to sort of explore the design space around what it means to you know, collect social media data, really focused on Twitter at the moment. And also, like, what does it mean to collect uh, web resources that are referenced within the, the, the Twitter data? So um, feel free to poke at this. You do need a Twitter account to actually do anything. So it'll kind of boot you over to Twitter to log it, you know, grant this application permission to, you know, use your account, et cetera. But I see everybody's kind of, there's several, lots of uh, people looking directly at me. So I guess, uh, yeah, you don't need to play around with it um, if you don't want to. <laughs> Um, so, the, the three, uh, and I kind of alluded to this on the first slide, but the three kind of main things we're trying to do um, are uh, build tools to help people do social media, uh, data collection, analysis, preservation, build communities, uh, a community of, I mean, communities already exist for doing this stuff, right? So part of it is just us tapping into them, figuring out who they are, where they are, what, you know, how, what we have in common with them. Um, but there are also, we need, for the digital preservation community, I think specifically, there, there's a need for uh, communities of practice around this work. And then also uh, this, this issue of ethics. So like, what does it mean to collect data that's out on the quote unquote public web? Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna get into this in a moment. But, uh, but so I mentioned the three things here on the same slide because they're really very interdependent. Um, you can't really have effective tools without an effective community. Communities that are trying to do things, they need tools to do the things <laughs> that they want to do. This probably sounds all like so obvious, but, but also I think the thing that maybe, maybe is obvious, but perhaps wasn't obvious to me, uh, you know, uh, a couple years ago, um, is that the tools themselves have ethics built into them. Whether we want to recognize it or not, um, they're there. The question is, do we know what they are? Um, and uh, do we know, uh, yeah, I mean, do, do we know what they are? Um, and uh, that's something that I personally did not always, uh, I feel like I didn't always recognize the ethical decisions that I was making as a software developer. Um, and so this project has been actually a lot of fun to work on because it's brought me into contact with people that are, are thinking about the tools in a very different uh, way than I traditionally have. Um, so the, the work began in 2014 when Michael Brown was killed in St. Louis um, by uh, Darren Wilson, a police officer. And uh, Burgess and I happened to be at a, a Society of American Archivists meeting here in DC and we were along with a lot of other archivists at that meeting talking about what will people know about this event 25 years from now, 50 years from now. We, everybody knew it was significant the week that it was happening, you know, just based on what you were seeing in social media. Um, yeah, we put this data set together, uh, basically a visualization of it. So the thing that happened that we didn't expect was that, uh, you know, and I probably should have, uh, but is that these events continued, right? And so uh, we saw, uh, you know, up until the current day, right? Like, um, but the, the thing that, that happened in Ferguson, this sort of heightened awareness in social media about the killing of uh, African-American men and women um, by the police uh, is something that was gonna continue and was gonna accelerate, right? Awareness of it was gonna accelerate and uh, you know, a whole social movement was gonna sort of swell up underneath that awareness, right? Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. So we didn't know that that was gonna happen, but you know, Burgess, um, as an archivist that's sort of attuned to like these uh, social issues, he, he, he saw it happening. And so we basically worked together to collect data around each of these, uh, not each of them, but probably about 15 or so different uh, incidents. 
Um, and, um, you know, another thing we didn't realize getting into it is that, uh, so we were doing a lot of this data collection uh, with the, I the idea that researchers would find it valuable to use, right? And uh, certainly at the University of Maryland, we've been working with a lot of, uh, actually primarily sociology, <clears throat> PhD students and professors who want to look at what happened in Ferguson, right? Um, and uh, and that, that's been super, right? But, and, and I mean, it, it speaks to the mission of the organization that I work at, the Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities. Like, this is what they want to be doing. But what, what we didn't anticipate is that the first people person to ask for the data was uh, this email that you're seeing here. And I've cut the from address off just because it, I don't know if it's, I guess I could show you it, but it, like I, I just feel like it's maybe not a great idea. But um, it was a defense contracting company in Boston, right? That that wanted to have access to the data. You know, go to their website, and there's like you know all this stuff about um, doing uh, uh, anti-terrorism work, right? And uh, so I was suddenly in the position of like, well, here's here's a researcher that wants to use the data. Um, do I give it to them? My answer was not to respond to this, just because, just because. But uh, now, um, if you've heard Burgess Jules, who is the person that usually speaks about this project uh, in public, um, talk about documenting them now. Uh, he was at DLF, I think, recently, and, and at the Collections as Data uh, uh, conference here in DC. Um, so, so you may have heard this already before, but like the thing that really when I heard him talk about it that really stuck with me is um, uh, data is about people, right? So yes, we collected 13 million tweets in the two week period after Ferguson, right? After Michael Brown was killed. But in that data are the, uh, the, the, the conversations of actual people, right? And, and what does it mean to, to get that content of theirs and, and to, to, to keep it, right? Um, to take it from the web. Um, and uh, so some of the people here, so actually some of these people are um, on our advisory board, but you see on the far left, uh, the gentleman with the red shirt on is Rasheen Aldridge, um, who was an activist using, social, using Twitter as part of his social media, uh, well, as part of his activism, sort of on the ground in St. Louis. All four of them were doing this, right? So, and Kayla Reed, you see uh, right to the right of, uh, Jonathan Federson, whose uh, head is unfortunately not fully visible, but um, um, Kayla Reed, and then to her right is Alexis Templeton, and then um, to Alexis's right is Ruben Riggs. And so we heard from them about how they wanted, this was in the meeting in St. Louis, how they want to be remembered in, in an archive. Um, and uh, this, this sort of really got us, like, you know, got the creative juices going when we were in St. Louis um, because uh, it, it just brought all these issues right like to the center. Um, so uh, I thought I'd just briefly describe some of the things that we're thinking about building into this tool that you're probably not playing with, but it's not gonna really look very much like that app.docnow.io application, but these are some of the things that we're hoping to build into the application that will address some of the uh, some of the ethical considerations around doing this kind of data collection um, on the on the on the open web, um, well, on the open web, but social media in particular. So where people are using platforms to communicate, right? Not not necessarily all web content. I'm really sort of focused here on on social media, um, but you may, if you do web archiving work, you may see some parallels. Um, so the first one is uh, notification. And uh, so notification, the idea there is, uh, what if, you know, if we're collecting Ferguson, the hashtag, the, app, the tool is, what if the application tweets out into the, the, the stream of content? This, we're doing, so and so, this researcher is doing data collection. This is who they are. This is why they're doing it. Um, puts it out into a tweet, into the, stream so like it's kind of almost like it's it's an effort right i mean i think dan chudnov kind of and i have had sort of like back and forth about whether this is a value or not but i, I think we kind of have come to the um 
to the, the conclusion that it is, it is an effort to put a signal out into the stream, right, that this activity is happening. The key thing there is that the, the tweet will have a URL in it that will take them to the application where they'll be able to see, you know, who, who is doing the data collection and why. Um, and importantly, uh, if they don't want to be part of the data set, they can basically use, as a Twitter user, authenticate, you know, and, and say, I don't want to be part of uh, this data collection and remove themselves. Uh, interestingly, and this was an idea Trevor Munoz, who I work with, had, uh, it, perhaps it's an opportunity for uh, people to opt in, to say, not only do, you know, can, I, can you use my data, but I actually wouldn't mind talking to you uh, in person about, like, if you're looking for people to interview, perhaps, you know, about, like, what's going on. Um, uh, basically, to, to people that wanted to opt into a conversation. Um, this one was uh, Jared Drake's idea, uh, one of his ideas, but uh, this idea of data retention. So when you're creating a collection, um, and this comes right out of, right, like archival work, um, but, uh, you know, the, what if uh, you could, when creating a collection, stipulate how long that collection would live? So I'm creating a collection of Ferguson-related tweets. I'm going to do some work with it, but I actually don't want it to live longer than a month. Right, so we see this kind of work with IRBs. Um, I think if you've gone through IRB before, you've kind of sort of been forced to kind of think about this, these kind of issues, right? But so we're building some of that into the tool. This, we probably could talk, you know, I only have very few minutes left, so maybe I should skip in case there's questions. Um, but uh, yeah, we could talk a long time about this, but the, the, the main thing with tweet IDs is that uh, Twitter's terms of service are very kind of uh, prescriptive about how data that you get from their API can be shared with what they call third third parties. And, um, uh, but one of the things they do let you do is uh, take a data set of tweet IDs. So an ID basically is a unique identifier, just a number, but a, kind of a long one, um, that sort of identifies the, the tweet. And you can share those with researchers. And researchers, when they get those tweet ID data sets, they have to turn them back into data. And to do that, you use their hydration API. And um, uh, in the process of that, like if anybody's deleted a tweet, um, you can no longer hydrate it. So you can no longer turn it back into data again. So it basically empowers uh, content creators to decide whether or not they want their data to be sort of widely circulating on the internet. Another idea that we have that we want to try implementing is uh, uh, traditional knowledge labels, which is an idea from the Mukutu uh, project. Um, where, um, and again, we could talk for an hour just about this, right? Uh, but the idea is that the, uh, they've done a lot of work, if you're familiar with them already, like about around um, uh, special labels for, that are, uh, that content creators basically kind of come up with that describe how they want their resources to be used. And that it really kind of grew out of uh, uh, work with um, uh, Aboriginal, I, think, I believe Aboriginal communities in Australia, but, um, but it's been used in sort of Native American uh, communities as well that want to share their content online, but also want to share it in particular ways, right? Um, and I believe the Library of Congress Folk Life Center is, is also kind of working closely with them. Um, another idea are warrant canaries. So this is the idea that, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you've been following like Brewster Kale's kind of like work at Internet Archive and how he's had these, um, these requests for data where, uh, He's not been able to, to what's the word for it? It's, um, uh, I always blank on the name of this, but like when, when you're basically at, the authorities come and ask for data, but you're not allowed to talk about uh, the, the, the request. What was it? What? Well, I think it, Patriot Act is a vehicle that they, they use, yeah. Gag order, there you go. Yeah, so the idea of canary, can, Warren Canaries is you put up a notification saying, I haven't gotten a gag order, you know, this year. And then, um, and then the next year you say, I haven't got a gag order this year. And then the third year, you don't say anything. You know. And then really underlying a lot of this is the, the, the tool is that we're thinking of, uh, build, we're really thinking of it as an appraisal tool. And this is me sort of projecting my own sort of interest on it a little bit, but... Um, and I think I share it with the, the other uh, team members. <laughs> um, 
But the idea is that it, it's sort of a tool to get to see what is going on on social media on a particular topic and what's going on on the web related to that conversation. Not necessarily a tool to go grab it all, right? It's, it's more a tool to like help you see what's going and then to make decisions about, well, what, what is a value here? Um, that's where we, I'm hoping it will get to. Um, so for example, you know, we saw those activists that were working in, in Ferguson you know, how do we find how how do we find them as as archivists, right? When we when we want when we want to document what's going on in the um, the Ferguson uh, uh, protests, um, so you can see already like that interest is very closely aligned to to um, those of uh, you know surveillance, right? Um, and so that's that's actually something that uh, that we need to kind of sort out. Um, and then this last one, I'm going to kind of skip through because I, I know we're running out of time, but um, uh, the deed of gift. So the idea is if you could identify individuals with social media accounts that, you know, um, uh, that, that are of value to the conversation, like perhaps you can get into a conversation with them about, it would be great if you could download your Twitter archive and donate it to the, to the archive. Um, so... Uh, you know, I'm sure there has been lots of conversations about big data, and big data, it does matter, right? I'm not here to say that big data does not matter. Um, certainly, we're concerned about making sure the tool that we build sort of scales, uh, you know, scale, um, but, and, and that uses, uh, we're, you know, we're going to use the cloud, you know, these scalability in the cloud, you know, big data. You know. But, um, but really, the project is about small data. Um, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, this idea of small data, but it, um, and I don't really even know if people are still talking about it. I, I know two Amelia's, that I, that I, two Amelia's, uh, Amelia Abreu and Amelia Acker kind of came up with this idea of small data, or at least they articulated it a couple years ago. And, um, and it's, it's really kind of resonated with me for a few years. And I, I, um, the idea is that, you know, Yes, big data matters, but also like the stories within that data matter, the context that's present in those in the in the smallness of the data matters as well, and um, and as archivists, it, it's extremely important. Uh, I can just keep going. I think this is like the second to last slide. Um, these are just three projects that we kind of think of them as sister projects in a way. They're they're. They're not, we're not like directly tied to them, but they're doing very similar work to what we're doing and we're, we're sort of cross-pollinating ideas between them. Um, the George Washington University is over there on the left because of the Social Feed Manager project, which actually some of our team members have worked on previously. Uh, we actually share a little bit of tooling between the two applications. So, uh, you know, in the spirit of open source, we're, you know, looking to sort of have some collaborations there. Um, and uh, the one in the middle, Rhizome, is there for the Web Recorder project. So they're actually another Mellon-funded uh, project, and they, um, they're really focused on, well, they, they're a web archiving tool, right? But they're very curator-driven, so it kind of speaks to the small data of our, our project when curators are making decisions to collect particular things. Web Recorder is a really nice tool, if you haven't checked it out, for, for doing that. It's basically a user-driven uh, application. They used to call it co-browsing, I think, like back in the day, like or back in a day. Um, but um, and then Mukutu, which we talked about previously, this is a sort of an aspirational link at the moment. We have had some conversations with them, but we haven't haven't actually picked any labels yet, worked on any labels with uh, any communities yet. But uh, this is sort of like the direction we're headed in. And uh, yeah, <laughs> we need help. Um, if, you, if this, any of this sounds interesting, uh, and, and I mean, it's an open source, so the, the, the tools are all open source, right? So um, there's assistance there, but, but really like the thing that, um, I mean, this is our website, right? But, and there's our, our blog where we write about what we're doing. Um, but we were using a Slack channel um, for the, the, basically the, for mediating the community uh, development. And um, that's been kind of a big surprise. So we've had uh, upwards over like 200 people kind of sort of join this kind of 
rag band of uh, rag band or ragged band. Um, I don't know. They're not that ragged, actually. They're kind of pretty uh, nice, upstanding people. But um, but yeah, the the idea there is we're a distributed team. So the the project team itself is just distributed, that core project team. But then, so we need a place to collaborate online, right? Because we're not working together uh, physically. Um, but then the idea is that to grow that circle outwards of other people that are sort of interested in, in doing similar work. And we gather in this Slack channel. Um, and so if you actually, yeah, if you need help getting to that, let me know. But um, th there is actually a, a form that you kind of, like you say, like I, I'd like to join with my email and then you get like a invite. And then there's a GitHub uh, where our, our stuff is, our code and experiments. So thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. Um, yes.